I like wanted to kick off actually before we dive into the case study. Your log of who you've worked with is just like all of like the, the big names in this industry. Um, yeah, like Cora, Zendesk, Server Monkey. I mean, it's it's huge, right? You mentioned Coinbase, everyone like that. I just wanted to ask you, I guess, two things that I think my audience are going to be really interested in. One, like, what's it like working with such well-known enterprises on this scale versus any like smaller startups? Like, what's the difference, and what's it like working with them? And two, like, how do you win? customers at that that, that that are so big i know people are going to love to work with their dream brands and things like what's your secret yeah i i want to answer the second one first because i i'm i want to be truly humble about this because it's it is pure luck like i did nothing like i didn't go to the right school i don't have a, an mba from harvard i never put out a brilliant case study i never worked for mckinsey and i when i look back at like how i was able to work with some really well-known brands pure luck and, and I'll walk you back through that process a little bit and you can see it's luck. And I would say to everyone out there, like you have to put in hard work so you'll notice the luck and you can take advantage of the luck, but cer some, certain things will just happen because you're right place, right time. So it, it all starts with me getting a full-time job at SurveyMonkey. And the reason I got a full-time job at SurveyMonkey was because when I, I, I live in Silicon Valley, when I moved out to Silicon Valley, I took the very first job I got an offer for and the person, and it was, it was a, okay job. It was doing affiliate marketing. And I, I learned a lot about SEO in that job. And I met some interesting people. The recruiter that hired me at that job, like the person that set me up for the interviews and gave me the offer. And I was friends with while I was at the company four years later or five years later was the recruiter at SurveyMonkey. So when I applied for the job, she called me on my cell phone and said, I saw you just applied for the job you're interviewing tomorrow. So that was pure luck. Like the fact that like someone I was friends with ended up being a recruiter at a company where the, the job description said something about like, you needed math degree from one of these like top universities. And I didn't have that. And I was coming from a startup. So then I get a job at SurveyMonkey and, you know, fortunately I was able to get through the interview and I get a job offer by working there and having such a big platform that people recognized, I was able to blog different places. I might not have been able to do at a startup. I was able to speak at conferences I was not would not have been able to get to at a startup. But more than that, when I, I sort of hung out a shingle and offered my services for consulting, and this is while I had a full-time job, it was because I was working at a large brand. So because I was working at a large brand, I was able to, on the side, work with a company like Blue Nile, which had formerly been a public company, which is now owned you know, by private equity. It's a billion-dollar brand. Because of that, I was put in touch with Quora and I was able to talk to the CEO of Quora about how they should do SEO. So as I did some of those things, I get those logos and, you know, I did some consulting with Zendesk and I built up that whole repertoire of logos and that opened up more logos. So in no way can I say I am very smart. I did hard work to get those logos. It was really like one stroke of good luck having that recruiter get me that job at SurveyMonkey open up all those other doors. Yes, I applied to SurveyMonkey. Yes, I had a good enough resume. And yes, I survived those interviews, but I can chart all that back to a string of good luck. And one other piece of good luck there is a lot of the companies that I was able to work with were affiliated with the Accelerator Y Combinator. And I worked with a partner, a Y Combinator partner at SurveyMonkey, and he's the one that introduced me to Y Combinator. And from there, all the introductions kind of sprinkled on. So again, a really good stroke of luck. Obviously I was friends with the person and obviously I was able to demonstrate, like he said to me, like, I've never met an SEO person that wasn't full of it. I've never met an SEO person that was honest and able to explain it. So he made those introductions. I had to earn those introductions, but again, huge stroke of luck. So I just want to put that out there. Yeah. Now yeah. working with large brands, I, re I love working with large brands because they're the canvas to do great SEO is better than any than any smaller company. So when you work with a brand like, um, you know, you mentioned Coinbase. So Coinbase generates billions of dollars in revenue as a whole. Working with a brand that has the ability to generate billions of dollars leaves an opening for generating billions of dollars with SEO. Also, if you work with a brand who has uh, fifty thousand dollars AR or a hundred thousand dollars AR or maybe even a couple million dollars AR there isn't so much room for growth in SEO. So I love working with those large brands for one, because there's the ability to really grow it. And second, I happen to be one of those 
odd people that love the diplomacy and the politics at large companies. Mm. When you work at a startup and you want to change a title tag, you probably have an access to the, the CMS and you just change the title tag. When you work at a really large company and you try to get them to change the title tag, everyone wants to weigh in. So you need legal <laughs> You need prior to weigh in. You need your boss to give you permission to talk to someone to weigh in. Like you need like the international team. You need to have a meeting with someone in, in Asia because like they want to understand how you change the title tag is going to extend the characters in the languages that they oversee. You need to meet the European person because the Asian person met with you. So they, right. So like all these people need wow. to weigh in. But then when you change the title tag and you see a result from that, you see huge gains. Like, again, the same thing you'd see at a startup, but you know that it took you six months to change one little title tag. So I like those things, again, because the scale of like, I finally got it changed and now we can see the impact. And I like that process of going through all of that and really getting everyone on board. Yeah, it sounds like a bit of a nightmare to me, but I understand like the impact <laughs> can be huge. So is it opening, like you said, opening up to billions more in value? Um, is that because they have bigger budget or is that just because they've already got like one test impacts so much already, you know, one, you know, what is that? Like, it's really the, it, so when we're doing good SEO, when you're out there and you're, you're building an SEO strategy, you're grabbing on the coattails of all the other good work that everyone else has done. Mm -hmm. So if a company as a whole, let's say you're doing SEO for McDonald's. It's nothing like doing SEO for a small store that sells the exact same food as McDonald's. McDonald's already has that massive brand. If they already have the conversion potential that when you do that search and you decide you want to go to McDonald's, you do it and you spend the money. Whereas that small brand is just that one teeny tiny small footprint. Mm -hmm. So that's where the opportunity is. Everyone else has already done that great work of building an amazing brand, building an amazing conversion funnel, building great product. And now you can open up this channel of organic traffic that they come into it. When you have that smaller brand, you can open up all the organic traffic you have. Google doesn't respect you because you don't have the brand. The user doesn't respect you because you don't have the brand. And even if they come in, the product is just not good enough compared to the other people's, the other sites that do have the brand. Mm. So it's such an uphill battle for startups. Yeah. I, it's yeah. awful. <laughs> yeah. Um, so do you think, I think I might've seen a LinkedIn post by you like about this maybe uh, a few weeks back I don't know if it was you but talking about the impact of investing in brand on your click-through rates or something like that like the fact that you see a brand you know in the SERPs like you're at, you're gonna click on that I don't know if that was me I do say a lot of things on this topic but <laughs> I think that's completely accurate and I, I think you know startups and smaller companies will get upset at Google and say well Google favors brands that's because users favor brands yeah. there's something yeah. about when you, uh, you know, you're in the UK, but I know a lot of listeners in the US and I don't know how it is on, in the UK on Amazon, but there's something about you go on Amazon. You're like, oh, I don't recognize that brand. That is definitely, I'm going to plug it in. It's going to smell like fire, right? Yeah. There's something to having a brand. There's something to like, well, McDonald's might not be the best, but I know it's going to taste like the last time I went to McDonald's. Starbucks might not be the best, but I know it's going to taste like Starbucks. You're not taking a chance. So that's why search engines favor brands because users favor brands. If, if users would go on and do a search and say, I'd like to buy a new hammer, and then they got the same array of results you get on Amazon, they're going to say, well, Google is clearly not the best place to buy a hammer. They're giving me all these stores I don't recognize, these brands I don't recognize. Yeah. I got to try yeah. to, right? So users favor brands. So, and that's where the click-through rate comes in. So as, as SEOs, they should be honest and say they work for a brand. They're getting a great click-through rate. They're getting, they're generating great profits. Brands can charge more money because someone else has done the work. However, you still have to do your SEO work to be visible and get out there, but it is so much easier to do SEO at a brand. Yeah. But that's, it's, that's a really important point because people, you should invest in brand building alongside SEO efforts alone and build your authority and you'll see the effect across, across the board, across all your um, channels of growth okay so i wanted to jump into the case study that was a good setup i think but let's focus on the survey monkey story over your time there uh you so you let me know just now it was about 200 million in organic revenue only uh per year at survey monkey over your time there um what's your like when so when did you join the company and like what's your kind of story there with the seo at survey survey monkey and then we'll jump into your like product-led seo and how that uh, yeah 
so like I, I gave you the backstory on how I joined Survey Monkey, and I, I was very lucky in that I was able to join. You know, at the time it wasn't that big of a brand, but it's still a recognizable brand. And as they got bigger, I was pulling onto the same coattails to, to increase my own brand. So I was there for about seven years. When I joined, the company had been through a couple iterations. The company was founded in 1999, which kind of predates most companies in the internet. And then it was a very small company until 2009 when it got venture funding and became a much bigger company. Yeah. So I joined in 2012, shortly after they had become a bigger company and shortly after they had started buying other companies and really investing in the product. They had never, ever done SEO. So the product was visible. In, they, the funny thing is, and I, I shared this on LinkedIn the other day, They, um, when I, I got there, they said, oh, well, we we're so glad someone's doing SEO. Here's three audits. So they had paid for audits, but no one had ever even opened the email. I saw that. So I met, yeah, so I met some great people. Like I was able to reach out to some well-known people in the industry and say, hey, I just joined SurveyMonkey to delete SEO and you did an audit two years ago can I meet you? I want to hear about it. And they're like, oh, I'm glad someone's finally reached out. Like, you know, the, the VC paid me to do this audit. No one ever even asked me about it. I just delivered it and got paid. So I love that. So I joined, I joined SurveyMonkey to do SEO. No one had ever done SEO. They thought they did SEO because they paid someone to do an audit, but they didn't open it. So we all know where that goes. <laughs> so uh, they, they were visible on some certain keywords. They were visible on the word survey. They were visible on the brand. But they were available in 16 languages, but they weren't visible in any of those languages because they did not use server side redirects. They redirected they, the, the other, they had subdomains. None of these pages were indexed. The survey pages, nothing, their links were a mess. They, when I, right after, right before I joined, Obama was president at the time. The VP of research had gone to the White House to do an event with Michelle Obama on bullying, and they created a survey just for the White House. Well, wouldn't you know it, they did a press release on this amazing event and they had a 404 link in the White House press release to SurveyMonkey. So they didn't even get a backlink out of it. <laughs> total, total mess. So, so I joined and was able to really build an SEO strategy. And I wrote a lot about this in my book because it, it was that's where I learned the soft skills. Prior to SurveyMonkey, I was at a startup where I had access to the CMS. If you know we had an editorial team and if I wanted to use a keyword, I told them to use a keyword and they used the keyword. I get to SurveyMonkey and I said, we should do a 301 redirect. And they said, nope, you don't get to tell us what to do. I said, can we change these links? And they're like, nope, you're in marketing. Go back to your seat, right? Like, so I suddenly had to learn all these soft skills, learn how to really develop a strategy, learn how to ladder into, I'm doing something now because in two months, I'm going to make a different ask. It took us, uh, I one of the big things I want to do was create TLDs for each location. So we were visible in 16 languages, but I want to have like a .co.uk. That took me four years to do, to be able to launch that. Like from the time I came up with the idea until it launched. And then by the time it launched, it didn't even matter. So little things like, oh, we need to make the page faster or little things like, can we change the title tag? None of those things mattered in the small scale because it took so long to do everything. So I learned all those skills. But like you said earlier, by the time I left, we're generating like on average $200 million a year in organic revenue. I was there for seven years. So easily a billion dollars in revenue came from the organic channel because even though it is a SaaS B2B, most of the users behave like consumers. They pay for it on their own credit card and they expense it. Yes, they're using it at work, but it was cheap enough that they could just do it. And organic was the biggest driver of all growth. Mm -hmm. Wow, it's amazing. I like that number as well, 1 billion. Um, something you mentioned, I think really interesting briefly before we hit record was that, um, it, and you kind of mentioned it again there, the fact that survey monkey acted more like a B2C company, um, that more like traditional SaaS, like enterprise B2B stuff. Would you say SEO is not for those kind of companies? Does it work? I think the biggest mistake that most people in SEO make is that they don't use the word customer journey or buyer's funnel in their in their vernacular and the way they speak to potential customers and they, and they speak to their, their managers. They focus too much on SEO metrics like rankings or even the worst things like technical SEO metrics like canonicals and redirects, which managers and clients don't necessarily care about. The buyer's journey and the funnel is so important. And you want to think about where SEO fits in the buyer's journey. And that's the thing that I've discovered with B2B. A lot of times it doesn't. So if you can't really visualize where SEO fits in that funnel, 
top of funnel, bottom of funnel, mid funnel. Like, yes, people always search, but how important is it to the buyer's journey? Uh That's always the question. So if you can't, again, if you can't visualize it, I'm not sure that you should even be focusing on SEO. B2B is one of those places we all, you know, most people are behave like businesses at some point or another. We discover things from our network. We discover things at trade shows. We discover things even in offline magazines and decide to try a tool. We don't necessarily behave like consumers where we're looking for a problem and we're going after an instant solution. So in those cases, I wouldn't necessarily invest in SEO. I would do a little bit of SEO. Obviously, if you're launching a website, make sure you your site is visible to search engines and use the you know some common best practices. But I wouldn't hire an agency. I wouldn't really spend any money on links because it's not going to be an, a, a channel that drives ROI. Mm, interesting. Is that even if say like those kind of keywords around like the tools, best tools for I don't know net promoter, you know, or like best tools for things that are more like enterprise level versions of those. Like let's say there are a lot of people searching for something like SurveyMonkey on an immediate level, like survey makers, that kind of stuff. Um, But if you want to implement, I don't know, like um, CRM, maybe you might type in top CRM tools or or something. There there is volume for it. Would you, would you suggest people just not bother or? Yes. Yeah. I would suggest they not bother. And and here's why, (laughs) because when it comes to those tools, those are very, they're singular keywords. So it's best CRM or CRM. And, you know, this might apply to like large brands like Salesforce or HubSpot, but the the number of keywords that they could potentially be visible on that are relevant within the buyer's journey are very few. So therefore you would do whatever you can for those keywords, but that doesn't mean you're hiring a full-time SEO manager. That doesn't hi- mean you're hiring an agency. That doesn't mean that this is like a real line item in your, your marketing budget. It's something that I'm going to create a best CRM page. I'm going to create a, uh, you know, a page that goes after those those keywords. But to really say there's a huge library of tens of thousands of keywords that are part of my buyer's journey, I find that hard to believe. And and this gets into where when I was a survey monkey, we had the exact same problem. The keywords would have been survey or best survey tool or like you said, net promoter score. But that's where I developed this process of you know what I call product led SEO, where you you really extend that tail into what users are potentially looking for. So what most users are looking for when they want a survey is they're looking to solve a problem. I want to know why my employees are leaving. I want to know why my customers are churning. I want to know why my teachers are mad at me. I want to know why my students are mad at me. So those are the problems they had. And that's where that's the product, right? That's the product challenge. So the product led SEO approach was we started building templates and pages that attacked that specific problem. So if we just focus on head SEO for our B2B terms, that survey tool, again, we would have... And we were able to rank on those things, but we would have been yeah. done. And we had international, so we'd have you know, done that time 16, but then we would have been done. By extending the tail into, it's not even the tail, but really focusing on the product that users want to solve mm-hmm. and that users were looking for, we now had hundreds and thousands of potential possibilities of pages that by the time I left, we never even finished that entire roadmap of pages we could build and then multiply that by all the languages. So that's essentially what product-led SEO is. You're building a search product or a product for search that search users are going to be looking for. Unless a SaaS tool has a way of doing that, and many of them don't, I wouldn't necessarily consider SEO to be an investment channel. Okay, we're, we're going to have to unpack this. I really, I love that approach. And I can see why it would work for something like SurveyMonkey, where your use cases are like almost like in, infinite in terms of the reason why you might want to survey someone could go quite vastly. When I research like product-led SEO, I feel like, do you, do you think people misunderstand what it, what it means sometimes? Because I see little different different definitions online. And from what you said, I think that makes sense. But there's also like programmatic SEO. There's also like using your product for SEO. And there's also like building products, content products. And could you could you like, yeah, bring that? Well, if anybody wants the real definition of product with SEO, they should buy the book, product with SEO. <laughs> it's a great book. Thank you. So, it, so what, what I call product led SEO is not a hack. It's you're building a product specifically for the search user. And the better way of, and the way I explain it, and again, everyone can do it their own way, but the way I visualize this and the way I explain it 
is it's the opposite of the way most people do SEO, which is a content approach where you're going on to, you know, Ahrefs is sponsor your podcast. I love Ahrefs. So you go on to Ahrefs and you find keywords, but that's part of a, a feedback loop of like someone searched the keyword. So therefore the show, so then other people search and other people create content for it. So we really encourage that. So you create content based on that feedback loop and that's your SEO. I, I sell insurance. I've written a, a piece of content around insurance. Again, focused on the keyword and your metric of success is am I ranking on the keyword? Do I generate any conversions from the keyword? When you think about a product-led approach is what does the insurance buyer want and what are they looking for on the search engine? So I'm going to create a product around that. That product might be informational content. That product might be a video. That product might be a podcast. That product might be a widget. But there is a thing that that search user wants. So I'm going to create that thing. Ideally, in the way you can scale SEO, there is a programmatic solution to that. Because if there isn't a programmatic solution, it gets very expensive. So if there's a programmatic solution, and in my book, I call out TripAdvisor as a programmatic solution. Zillow in the, in the, in the US is a programmatic solution. NerdWallet is a programmatic, much of NerdWallet's content is programmatic. A lot of finance sites is a pro, like if you're looking for the price of a stock today, this, the programmatic solution is widgets that incorporate the stock price. If you're looking for the market cap of a company, you don't need a blog post that explains market cap and then applies it specifically to a company. It's a programmatic solution. So that's, that enables you to scale it. But at its heart, it's just the product. The programmatic is a tactic to create that product. Right. Okay. So, uh, yeah, I think that's, I think that's pretty clear. Do, do you think... Um... Is an example, you know, how Google creates these often, like if you type in a uh, stock price for X, they've created their own widget that takes the top spot. Are they sort of like that? They're building for the, that group. So I call those things search arbitrage. And it doesn't exist so much anymore because Google disintermediates it by buying the same data. Hmm. So whoever, if you have stock prices, you essentially buy it, a feed from the stock market, whoever the exchange is. Google also can buy that feed and that's what they've done. So there's many different places Google has started to do this, which really cuts into the programmatic and product led approaches that people have done, but that's because they were taking shortcuts. So the startup I spent you know, a number of years at before SurveyMonkey, we were in the automotive space. So we created automotive editorial, but part our automotive editorial was based on automotive fact feeds, which came in from different companies like pictures. Those are stock pictures that we bought. Pricing, those are stock pricing we bought, um, and then specs, right? We just bought it from a company that collected it from the car company. So we were able to benefit from that at the time. However, Google just said, you know what? You do a search on a car, we're pulling in the price. We don't have to go and crawl pages to figure out what the price is. We'll just buy it from that company. And now you no longer need to search anymore. So if your SEO approach is like, I'm just going to buy a bunch of data and then I'm going to make a page around it, Google will cut you out. If instead what you're going to do is pull in the prices and then create a product around it and say, I'm going to pull in the prices from this company, but I'm going to analyze who gets the best value. So now I'm going to have a value to price page. That's not something Google is going to do. If you're going to say, well, look at the size, like here's the price merged with the, the pictures, again, a different product. That's not something Google is going to buy. Even look in the medical space where you search symptoms. There's so many websites you know, that have built content around symptoms and, and content around diseases, essentially to sell people and scare people. Google has cut those people out too by taking the same doctor approved data and say, no, you don't have cancer. No, you probably have COVID. Like look at the exact same things. All those websites that did it, now they've lost the traffic to, to Google. But if instead you took in that data and then you built a better product of like, why does someone search? Do they have brain cancer when they have a headache? So how do you tell them that they should drink more water? This is a better page. And these are the symptoms of brain cancer that Google does or that everyone did in the past before Google cut them out. Yeah, it's fascinating. And you, you do say, you do talk about this in the book for quite a big portion of it, but how do you, how does this drive growth for companies beyond capturing all their traffic? Like, how do you align this strategy with what you do? Um and maybe use SurveyMonkey as an example. But. So again, the most important thing for me when I really strategize SEO is buyer's journey, the funnel, like understanding the funnel. So provided I we have understood the funnel and we know where search is a part of that funnel, it becomes a part of the growth strategy. So we're unlike, there are a lot of SEO teams and you know I've worked at a lot of brands and, and brands 
The best thing about brands, again, I think it's amazing, but most people think it's terrible, is the politics at brands. Mm -hmm. The fact that like everyone gets super territorial and they watch out for who steps on their toes. And then it becomes even worse when you become a manager. So now you have to watch out for your direct reports toes and your boss is watching out for your toes. And like everyone's fighting these fights. And you're like, could you just like maybe do your job? <laughs> and then it it just works on a different schedule. And it's amazing. Like I love you know, I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to talk about my clients, but I'll talk about the companies that I've been able to talk to as potential clients. I love learning about their processes and getting under the hood and saying, wow, I can't believe everyone respects this brand. It's super dysfunctional. They've been through four CEOs. Dude. This VP has no idea what they're doing. I love that. It's just amazing to discover that you meant like we talked earlier, we talked about startups. That's the advantage startups have. They're not dysfunctional. They're hungry. They do their jobs. They're not focused on their politics. Mm -hmm. So when once you understand the buyer's journey and you understand like how it's supposed to fit as a part of the growth of what you're doing from a search standpoint, then you can again very hard at big companies. You can understand how all those all those other pieces are going to play together. Again, very hard because everyone's watching out and they don't want to play together. But bigger part of the bigger strategy is what I'm going to do is I'm going to capture traffic at the top of the funnel and you pay team you're going to retarget it and convert it and you CRM team you're going to get the email address so you can send emails and try to get them to upgrade. And you, the growth team, once I've gotten some free users, then you'll go and get them to eventually pay us. So when everyone's working together, and again, this is so hard because everyone's so territorial and they want to get the whole piece of the pie. When everyone's working together, that's where SEO fits in as a miraculous part of growth. So early on in my journey at SurveyMonkey, it's very easy to do because there was far less siloed territorialism and politics. Later on, definitely got more complicated. So huh. Monkey, the search was top of funnel. People are searching for something. They want a solution. They find it. SurveyMonkey was free. So they decided the solution was good enough that they were only going to put in their email address and password and create an account. The other teams were responsible to finish that process. So the paid team was, oh, you're a free user. We're going to retarget you with a special offer to sign up and become a paid user today. The growth team was going to say, oh, you're a free user. We're going to give you some upgrade triggers so you want to pay us and get more features. The CRM team was going to capture that it came from organic and send them an email 24 hours later and say, hey, you're a free user. These are some things you'll get if you pay. So everyone's working together. And that's how we unlocked the $200 million a year in revenue. I'm not going to take credit and say, well, they immediately went and did a search and then they put their credit card in and done. No one else had any hand in this. As long as everyone's working together. And I, I don't like when... Everyone does this, of course, when the paid team's like, oh, I'm amazing. I spent $4 million on paid. Look how many conversions I got. Like you spent $4 million on paid. Most of that was brand advertising. So you're benefiting from the brand. And then a good chunk of that was organic search clicks, first clicks that you turned into last clicks of paid with retargeting. So again, every team does it, but working together, you can really get that whole journey, which does good for the company, does good for the shareholders. But really, you have to understand the beginning, the where SEO fits in the buyer's journey to make all that work together. Yeah, yeah, I think I've, I think you've you've explained that really well. That way, that all those teams need to work together. Would it, it sounds like what you're saying though is that SEO really is just like a top of funnel mass, like kind of how do we grab as much attention as possible from our target audience? Is that like would you say SEO is best for top of funnel? Then essentially, grab it, retarget it, like that. It it's commonly top of funnel, but I wouldn't say it's only top of funnel. That's what I, I when you say I was talking about buyer's journey. You really have to understand the buyer's journey hmm. to really acknowledge where that search happens. So, and, and you know, again, again, everyone in the SEO industry is focused on keywords and they talk about topics and intent and all this stuff. The keywords are actually what tells you where they are in the buyer's journey. So let's say a keyword might be best TVs to buy. That's super top of funnel. When you get to the bottom of the funnel, it's 65 inch Samsung Roku TV, uh, where to buy or best deal. Like that's bottom of the funnel. So it depends on the product you've created to, to figure out where it is in the funnel. Mm -hmm. And then you build the content. Again, maybe your tool is helping people make decisions in your affiliate site. So then you want to be very high in the funnel. If you're e-commerce, you want to be very low in the funnel because you need people to just go in, put it in the cart and check out. So it's commonly top of the funnel. It's easier to do SEO at the top of the funnel. It's broader, but it really, really depends on the site. Um, how was, what, what kind of product-led content did you do at SurveyMonkey? 
like what was the what was the over that over that journey you said you were there for seven years like what what were you what I know we talked about kind of attacking those problems to solve like you know you want to understand why your students or employees are leaving how did you capture like all of those at scale for survey monkey it was primarily survey templates okay that was the product and it's not that complex but again if you tell so oh what's your product that you did at survey monkey well, we made survey templates I'm like that's easy weren't you done in a day no they actually never finished that entire library so like that that's the big company challenge you come up with the product and it takes a it takes a lot to move it and then you find out there's tech debt and you discover, well, you have this idea of making 10,000, but apparently our CMS can only handle doing 200. So let's go to back to the drawing board and find another CMS. Oh, you want to make 10,000. We don't know how to cross link them. We now need to build another product to have these categories. We now need to build a product that if someone clicks, they want to sign up on that template, it launches into their account. So those products become more and more complex and are only a, a part, again, of the buyer's journey. So the product was survey template. So what you want is what you created was a lot of programmatic content around stop customer churn. And then from stop customer churn, we had to explain that you're going to go into this customer satisfaction or customer loyalty survey template. So the product already existed. We had to create more templates. The content was very simple, but that was the product. So we had thousands of those. Mm, wow. And I something I think is cool that you said a few places that I've read is that like when you have such an, a library of templates that's super useful, or even it's so across any brand, like even you have a library of content um, that's like a product itself, it doesn't matter if like Google uh, disappeared, people would still be coming back to you for for using stuff like that. Yeah, absolutely. And and that's something I love talking about. And like, I think I put in some couple predictions for the, the next year. I think that we're going to see other search engines other than Google. And what that means is, I don't know if you've played with Neva, the paid search engine. I, I think when people think like, oh, there's no competitor to Google, they think, well, Bing's not a competitor, so therefore it's, there's no competitor. I think user behavior will change to the to the tune of there could be another place that people use search to discover information. So TikTok could make a tech search engine where they now show results. Uh, uh, Amazon can make a search engine where they show results. Facebook can make a search engine where they show results. They're probably not going to be as good as Google, but they'll get a lot of the search market share. And they'll probably behave very much like Google. So instead of you looking for hacks on how do you rank better on Google, you'll now have to be like, how do I create a good enough product that no matter which search engine people use, they'll still come to me and like my brand. And I, I think it's good for search because we'll stop trying to hack Google and just trying to do good things for users. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in yeah, interesting. Okay, it's, it's, so it's sort of a very like an anti-SEO SEO strategy in a way. So you need that, right? Like someone recently, uh, your client asked me about, well, isn't SEO going to disappear with all the tools we have? That's like saying you don't need car mechanics anymore because all cars are electric. It's just the way we do things are different. Teslas still break. They just break differently than gas operated cars from years ago. Everything's constantly changing. So you always need SEO because I don't think we'll ever be in a world. I don't think chat GPT overtakes Google. Because it's just not, to me, it's not possible that you always have the right answer or something. Users do want to look at multiple results and and no AI will ever be in someone's brain because it's AI, it's artificial, to know exactly what they want at the exact same second. So yeah. you need possibilities of results. So as long as that exists, where search engines are doing the best to understand the user, you need SEO to do the best to position the websites to the search engine algorithms. It will change. When I first started doing SEO, you buy a lot of links and trade Google. I think it'll change in the future and it'll change based on the engine. Like maybe Apple will have some schema they require. So SEO will be advocating for that schema within websites. And it, it doesn't have to be, again, technical hacks and all these things. It's literally about optimizing the site. So it's best for search. So it's not anti-SEO in the yeah. sense that we don't need SEO. It's anti-SEO in the sense that SEO is done. I think by many people that are trying to hack Google and look at, you know, ways to get ahead in Google when really we should be best positioning websites that are optimized for the search engine that is popular. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, totally agree. <laughs> it, it's uh, it's anti the way a lot of SEOs do it right now, but potentially. But I, I agree, like SEO is not just about Google. It's about optimizing to distribute through search engines, essentially. Um, it's a channel. It's the, It's the search channel. So the same way... It's almost like in paid, I think Google 
would love for there not to be any paid agencies anymore. I don't know if you've ever dabbled in paid, but Google's always trying to like cut out the agency and then use their algorithms to just do pay directly, which is insane, right? Like give us your money. Well, don't worry. We'll spend it efficiently for you. You don't need an agency. It's like that. You'll always need that layer in between. So with paid, yes, the rules have changed. And I, when I did paid years ago, you actually did manual bids. The rules have changed that you can't do that anymore. So now you have people operating the algorithms. It's like, again, airplanes. Years ago, they would fly with a stick. And now like you just need someone that controls the autopilot. We're, we're, SEO will change. The way we do SEO will change. And trying to complain about like, well, SEO used to be like this and I want to be like that. You don't have the power. <laughs> you don't have the soapbox or the power to do that. <laughs> It sounds it sounds a lot better than constantly like hacking and, and optimizing. It's it's a bit of a rat race. Um the way it um so I, I wanted to go back quickly to like the um, the templates created at SurveyMonkey. You said you created some of that programmatically. And um, like how or how was it like from start to finish? Would you like identify a use case, create a, like customize the temp the, the survey template for it, then create a landing page? Like how did how what was the kind of process for deciding which templates to create next? Um and, re- and finally, was there really no keyword get in Ahrefs, like, let's make these templates first? <laughs> okay, so <laughs> there, uh, I, I'm very anti-keyword because I think the way most people do this is wrong. But keywords are a part of this because keywords are going to tell you how people search. But I, I wouldn't build it totally off of Ahrefs I would be, or any keyword list. I would build it off of user data and the best user data you're going to get is search suggest. So, and, and the best user data I was going to get for survey monkey was surveys. So we had a, we had a very efficient product. And when you onboarded, you explained what you were trying to do with the survey. So what are you trying to, who's the survey for, who are you, who's the survey for, and what are you trying to solve? I actually used that data to prioritize which surveys I was going to create. So I learned that one of the most common use cases was customer churn. So now understanding customer churn, I can do very specific keyword research as a part of my research to understand which templates to create on customer churn. So is it retail customer churn? What are the things that people Google? And again, I'm not going in the heads of, I'm not looking at the keyword. I'm trying to get into the head of the person that searches for a customer churn survey or the person that is a customer churn problem person, like the manager of a store or the owner of a store instead of the person that just searches that keyword. Mm -hmm. So that's where I use the keyword research to say, what would a manager do this? Who's trying to fix customer churn? What would they look for? Now I'm going to create the template and you just use the title tag of that thing that they wanted rather than, oh, churn looks like a good word. We'll call it customer churn template. So that would itself rank without you having to, you know, perfectly match exactly what the keyword was in Ahrefs. And exactly. But more importantly, because I attacked the user and attacked the problem, when I ranked, I converted because it's exactly what the user, my user wanted. It didn't matter whether I was number three and there was a variety of results there. The user I wanted to convert came to me and came to that page and converted because I'm focused on them. It makes so much sense. But when you come from that point of view, rather than the, how can I get the most traffic point of view where you're just like, oh, I need to exact match this one keyword. And all of the the uh, courses around SEO will tell you the opposite of what you're kind of saying like it needs to be like perfect and yeah and it really it it changed your metrics of success change and i would again i was so fortunate i'm gonna chalk it up to luck again like i had amazing managers amazing bosses and like amazing mentors at survey monkey and i was able to do this because they didn't have someone say in my ear like oh i don't care that you got this customer churn thing how come we're not ranking number one for this term no one ever said that to me And I was judged based on the revenue I created. And I was judged based on my impact. So much to the point, like I had a team of five. I didn't need a team of five to really go after this. Like we were able to do so many things because my team was generating two thirds of the global revenue. And Mm. that was more important. If you're in a company where they're like, oh, stop thinking about all this other stuff and stop thinking about buyer's journey. Your job is just to optimize and tell me what I should do about this, this redirect here and, you know, give me canonical updates and change my meta description. That may be what you have to do as a part of your job. But I was fortunate in that I was supported in going after the bigger, better goal. Okay, so I, I want to kind of bring this home for people because there must be a lot of people thinking like, right now I'm sold. I want to do it. 
and I think like how how okay my next question is is this for everyone how do you know if this could work for you and then to like how can I identify the opportunity like where do I start to figure out this what is my thing it is for everyone so everyone listening if you do this if you're focused on SEO the way it is in the courses and hacking keywords like I, I this is something I saw early in my SEO career you will only get paid by the amount of money you generate for the company you have. So if you're like hacking keywords, but you really can't chart to revenue and you're only getting paid $50,000 per year, or I don't know, 50,000 pounds per year, it's a little bit better. And you want to get a raise, but no one can really articulate that you're driving better value than that. It's hard to get a raise. Mm. If you can figure out how to tie yourself to a bigger product and a bigger revenue goal Again, in my case, it was $200 million a year and I wanted budget to hire more people and get more tools. No one ever said no to me. Oh, can I get Ahrefs? It's only going to cost me. I think we had the biggest plan, $10,000 per year, whatever it was, we paid Ahrefs. No one ever said no because we're like $200 million a year. That's a very small amount of money. The pay team spent $2 million per month and returned $2 million per month. I spent hundreds of thousands of dollars per year and returned $200 million per year. So it was easy to justify that. So as, this is for you. If you're stuck like optimizing keywords, you'll always be stuck optimizing keywords. But if you can think bigger, then the opportunities are almost endless. You know, just for some very rough math here, Google generates $200, $200 billion per year off of ads. Like just that's their revenue. I don't know what the, we can estimate to be the click through from those ads. Let's say it's 10%. Let's say it's 20%. The value of the organic clicks, and I ran, Fishkin has all these opinions on how much, you know, that, how many organic clicks are left. Regardless, the value of the organic clicks are left are in the trillions. So think about the trillions. Think about the impact you could drive from a, you know, revenue standpoint rather than, well, the impact I drove is I'm number one on this keyword or the impact I drove is I got all these clicks or I got all these impressions. Think bigger. So it is for everyone to think bigger. It just may not be at your current job. So figure out a way to think bigger. If I can help anybody get a better job, I love doing that. I don't get paid. No way I earn money from that uh, right now. I, if I can figure out a way to do it, I will. But I, I love when people get bigger jobs and heck, have bigger opportunities and can get into brands that they can have bigger impact. So this approach, I think, is for everyone. Mm, okay. Well, you mean you should make a course. That's how you can do it. You can help people on scale. For now, I have a book. So check out my book and hopefully it helps you to think bigger and better. Yeah, true. No, it's a great book. I really changed the way I think about SEO as well. Um, okay, so what about that other part of that question, which is like how to identify the opportunity for you? I think, you, is it user research? Is it? Buyer's journey. So it it's really, you have to focus on, if, take that step back. I think I talked to a lot of marketers and I think most marketers are about this, not just SEO. They forget how the customer buys something. They think only like a marketer. So get into the heads of the customer as much as possible. If you're at a travel site, I, you know, I've met people at travel sites always focused on this keyword and I need to create this product and this is what people want. And, it's, and, I, and I would just ask them like, if you were looking to plan a vacation, is this what you would do? And they're like, well, I, I guess not. So just do that. Pretend you're like the buyer and then think like, where would I Google? When would I Google? There's products like, you know, this is not so much talked about anymore, but like doing mobile SEO. Early on when mobile SEO was a thing where you're doing mobile versus desktop, depends on the product. If you're doing like some B2B product, then probably it's not mobile SEO. Now, of course, it is mobile SEO. So you really want to think about where's the customer? What do they look like? What are they doing when they're doing this? What are they going to search? So that's part of it. So some of it you could just try to come up with your on your own. And some of it you could do user research and just be that customer and think like that customer. Yeah, there's a really good example from your book about a healthcare company and the, and the content that you would create for them. Would you mind like re recounting that story for us? I don't remember exactly. My editor wanted me to come up with a really good example. And I had just been in the middle of, of working with the healthcare client. But I would say like, I come up with examples like this three times per week when I talk to potential clients and they, they're they asking me about how do we do our keywords and how do we do all this? And I say, there's a product-led approach, which I call, which I have another chapter called Blue Ocean SEO, which is the idea of it, the simplistic way of Blue Ocean SEO is zero search volume keywords. But I, again, that's still focused on keywords. Blue Ocean SEO is creating an entire product category for something that people are searching for, but doesn't exist yet because no one has created it. So the feedback loop doesn't exist. Oh. The best example for me is Zillow, which... Zillow is the home valuation site in America where 
they knew it, it should exist. It didn't exist. So no one searched for it. So there was no search volume for it. But when it, once it existed, they created an entire category. So that's Blue Ocean SEO. So the healthcare company I was I came up with for the book was thinking about when someone does these kinds of searches, let's say for a skin condition, they you can pull in a bunch of government data, you can pull a bunch of things, but then you're competing with everyone else that has the same thing. But if you try to get into the minds of what is someone searching when they search for this kinds of thing, what do they expect to find and then create the product for that? And then you can funnel them either to whatever you're selling or actually help the user, then that would be a good search product. So definitely check out the book to get more in more a detailed example of that. But every time I have a client call, there's always a way of coming up with Blue Ocean SEO by using, again, it, provided that it, SEO is a part of the buyer's journey. There's always a way of coming up with a Blue Ocean SEO where there is something someone might be searching. And then you build an entire product around that, whether that's home valuations, which obviously Zillow did, whether it's travel, whether it's... Um, even e-commerce products. E-commerce products is harder. But again, if you want to understand what it is it that someone's searching for, then you can create a product around what they're searching for and then bring them to the existing product. For e-commerce, it might be something higher up in the funnel. Let's say it's clothes. I want to, I want to bring the best clothes to work. How do I dress for work? So now you can do SEO around that and then bring them lower in the funnel where they add something to cart. But that's the blue ocean. And that's the product you want to create. And it's based on you deeply understanding your user. The other thing I always say when I talk to startups, they're always, they always seem to be focused on these keywords. Like, okay, we got a bunch of money from our, our investors and we want to build SEO around these keywords that we know people are looking for. But the reality is when they made their pitch deck and they got investors to give them money for something that potentially existed already, they had a pivot on it. So they would say, well, all these other companies sell products like this, but we're going to do it like this. So you should give us money. But then when it comes to SEO, they do SEO exactly like those other companies they said they're disrupting. They need to take whatever they said they're doing. Like, this is our pivot. This is how we're different and showcase that in their SEO. Uh -huh. I sort of came up with that by talking to a, a friend of mine who was asking me how to do uh, SEO for their insurance company. So they came up with this new insurance lead gen site. And they were like spending all this money on Facebook. And they said, there's got to be SEO here. Uh -huh. So it's impossible for you to do SEO because you're trying to compete against in America against the brands like Geico and Progressive and Prudential who their websites are actually older than Google. So those guys have been around longer and there's dozens of them. Uh -huh. So the best they could hope is to be on page three behind all those dozens of them. But even then you would, they have to be come behind all the other companies that came before them. So then as I'm talking to him, asking more about the business, I discovered that they were the insurance lead gen site of choice for people that had DUIs, for people that got arrested for drunk driving, they helped them to get new insurance. And that's why their investors funded them. So like, well, why wouldn't you build SEO around that? And DUI. Right. right, instead of focusing on insurance or car insurance as their keyword, focus on that because actually that's what they do. That's what they convert on. And that's what no one else is doing. And they built their SEO around that. So what, okay, so what content did they create? What did they do? I don't recall. I don't I don't know that they're around anymore <laughs> because it wasn't <laughs> big enough space for them. Uh, but the same content they were going to create around regular insurance, which again, everyone has done like, oh, this is how much insurance is, this is how much insurance it costs, this is why you need insurance. Here's how to pick your limits. They just did that for drunk drivers. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's smart. It's like identifying your differentiation and, and coming up with the unique it's not even identifying it's really keeping the strategy the same like in our paid market and again seo is is silly because like in paid marketing no one says oh i want to rank number one for like the biggest keyword in the space They're like i want the i want to pay for the clicks that are going to turn into conversions so just do that for seo like why would you put all your effort behind a keyword that you're not going to convert in put all yeah. your effort behind exactly what your product does so for this company is like well you're doing all your paid marketing around drunk drivers you're doing all of your um your content on the site around drunk drivers, just do SEO around drunk drivers and it's all one and the same. You don't, there's no thinking that's necessary. Just do it the same. It makes sense when you when you put it like that. I mean, it's, it's not like going too far away from why your customers love you right now and finding out how to find people with that same problem kind of thing. Um, exactly. um, cool, okay. I think one, okay, one last question. What What do you think, let's say I'm going to go and do this now myself. What's, what's going to be the, the barrier that's going to stop me doing this successfully what's going to be that mistake that i will fall in 
And okay, so this so this is where I, I, I get strange again because I love the politics of the big companies. If you're at a small company and you can instantly create a big product a product around SEO and you have all these tools and abilities, you probably don't have scale to really drive ROI from it. Mm. If you're at a big company, you have scale that could drive ROI from the strategy, but then you have politics that are going to hold you back. So that's the reality. It, it's it's this conundrum of Small companies don't have scale. They don't have a big enough product like this drunk driving company. I think they went out of business. They weren't big enough. There weren't enough drunk drivers. They when they when If they could scale, they didn't have enough leads and they were still competing against everyone else. However, if uh, a big insurance company would, were to decide to do that drunk driving product, if they were successful, they would certainly have the scale. They'd certainly have the money to be able to insure drunk drivers, which I'm sure is very expensive. However, imagine how many meetings you would have to do to make that product actually ship. So that's always going to be your challenge from doing that. Mm -hmm. Okay, great answer. Um, thank you so much. This has been really great talking to you and uh, I've learned, we've learned so much. So yeah, um, everyone should definitely come follow you on LinkedIn. Uh, that's where I follow you. I'm sure you're on Twitter. I don't know if, how's your, how's your relationship with Twitter at the moment, but. Um, <laughs> Still there. Five Ellie is my handle. <laughs> Okay, cool. Um, um, yeah, okay, cool. Is there anything else um, I've missed that you think needs to mention um, before we go off? Just want to reiterate that if SEO thinks bigger, the opportunities are endless. If you focus only on the nuance and the tactics right in front of you, then you can be successful at those things, but think bigger. Put more zeros behind all of your goals. Okay, <laughs> great advice. All right, thank you very much. Thanks, Ben.